Those of you who are on Twitter will be aware of who my guest is, and I'm delighted to present her. I, was, I wasn't saying I was shocked when she said she was going to say yes, but I'm just delighted to get somebody of, of her calibre and yes, of that level of crack. Marion Keyes, how are you? I'm fine, actually, Philip. How are you? I'm great. Thanks very much indeed. I'll tell you, I, I, you're a writing person, so you'll understand this, and most of the people who are watching will like writing that kind of thing. About 12 minutes ago, I got an yeah. email from my publisher, right? And I damn near oh. had an accident, right? Because, you know, oh. nobody wants a letter from the publisher or an email from their publisher at this point in time. But it was fine. They were looking. Everybody's working from okay. home. Because uh, myself and this other fella from uh, from Shista, or from Hoosby here in Stockholm, where we have two youth novels coming out about a fictional soccer club. And I thought, Jesus, if they're after killing oh. these two things, uh, I'll tell you the story sometime about how the force came out, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, it was uh, delightful to see that. But how's your book doing? We'll start with that. How's Grown Ups doing for you at the moment? Well, it's done and dusted, Philip, in that, like, it's been published in in kind of the English-speaking part of this world, like Ireland, um, the UK, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. So, I mean, I just feel incredibly lucky that all my stuff was done. Now, things that are happening later in the year have been cancelled, like I was due to go to South Africa in May and Canada and the US in June. But sure, look at, do you know what I mean? Like, it is what it is. We're on, in unprecedented times. And um, in theory, I'm right again, except I'm not, because my concentration is destroyed. It's an absolute flitters. The first question I was going to ask you was, uh, you know, are you getting any work done? But you sort of answered that by saying, you know, uh, that, that you're not. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and, and, and the funny thing is, yeah, go on, go on. No, I was kind of, I just wanted to ask you, you know, it, it, we'll say all was well with the world, right? And that you could turn on the radio without, you know, going absolutely demented about what's happening and things change and, and that kind of thing. How do you normally go about the process of writing when you sit down to write the likes of Grown Ups and that kind of thing? Is it, you know, do you have a plan? I know Paul Howard, you know, Paul is like very structured and he gets I do, it. I know Paul very well. Yeah, yeah. and, and he, he has his breakfast before he goes to bed and he gets up before he goes to sleep and he has everything done by the time oh. layabouts like me are, are out of the bed oh, like I did. But what, no. what are you doing today? Okay. I'm really slow. Like I spent ages putting together characters, you know, trying out characteristics on them, taking them away, putting them in situations. Sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Um, and I kind of, I write from the gut or, or the heart rather than from the head. And it's the only way I can do it. Like, I mean, there's no wrong way to write a book, but this is my way and it's a very long way. And then I just try and I show up every morning and Every single morning I have the fear because I think anything creative, you feel like you're cre creating something out of nothing. You know, it's, I used to work in accounts, like I used to do figures and it was so great, like if it ba balanced, you knew you had done your job and if it didn't balance, you knew you had to go back and find the mistake. But with something like a book, you don't, I never know, oh, is this person believable? Is this person likable? You know, and, and an awful lot of it is kind of, or second guessing myself and and then pestering the people around me you know to read it and stuff so you know I write very slowly and you know people talk about doing a kind of a, a crappy first draft and and then go back and refine it you know and they do maybe several drafts I literally do one draft start to finish like one draft but by the end of that it's like two and a half years later um so it takes a while for me for my crappy first draft, um, and so yeah, that that's my way. But you know, the, whatever works. You know, as long as you're trying to write, that's all that matters. Yeah. Uh, the last book that we wrote there, right? As I said, we created this fictional soccer club, and it's me and this lad who's like half my age from uh, Northern, a suburb of Northern Stockholm here. And we, we usually say that we write books for people who don't read, right? Which is pretty good because they've been written by people who can't yeah. write. <laughs> but the thing is that, you know, but, but we sit down, we, we use it, it's like a tennis match, right? So I fire something over to him, and then he fires it back at me. Yeah. And this is the way it works. And it's a fascinating process to work with somebody else because, you know, you're trying to sort of place demands on one another and that kind of thing. And the fighting that goes on is unbelievable you know but when it comes to the end of the books yeah. I'm always the one who gets to drag it over the line so he never knows the end of the book right and I do this little thing where you, yeah, you know yeah. when you watch those uh, those American TV shows like Flash Gordon that we grew up with and you're planting little seeds all along they're going to turn up at the end of the book some, uh, somehow you know but we kind of do the opposite to you because we go really really quickly because I don't know if it's ADHD or what it is but we just sort of bang yeah. through but do you ever get really tired or annoyed with your characters because when you live with them for as long as you do they become party right yeah but yeah I do I absolutely do um 
I have a very good friend who's always also a writer. And usually when she gets to the end of her book, um, she says, you know, and she's trying to end it. You know, she says, I just want to kill them all off in a car crash. Like, because, yeah, because I'm having to tussle with them on a daily basis and trying to make them work. Yeah, there are times, not just really that I hate the characters, but just that I hate the book. And then, you know, by the time the editing is done and then the copy editing and then the proofreading, I absolutely hate it. And I never, ever, ever want to see it again. And again, that's kind of normal, I think, you know, for for anyone who creates anything. By the time it's done properly, you absolutely hate it. You know, it, it, because it's caused an awful lot of trouble. And also because it's just stuck around for so long. And then it's maybe only six months later that I can kind of go, oh, actually, you know, it, it's not bad. It's, it's a funny... It's, it's a funny process, like. Do, but do you ever feel when you go back then, right, to, to the books that you've written and you look at them, like, I'm enormously self-critical. As soon as the book is out of my hands, I want to change the oh, whole God. thing. I go, ah, Jesus, I can't believe I did that or that he said this I or know. she did that, you know. But do you ever feel, is that something you take with you to the next book? Like, when you're writing grown-ups, do you think, well, you know, I, I made this mistake yeah. and that kind of thing. And, you know, how do you not yeah. beat yourself up about it? Because, I mean, you've sold more books than most people alive, you know. How do you not sort of, you know, give yourself stick after a new book because by right you should know everything by now right <laughs> oh but nobody ever knows anything <laughs> and especially i mean for an awful lot of people and, and like i'm one of them i never learned like i didn't do an english degree i didn't do a creative writing thing so i've learned my craft on the job and like the thought of reading my earlier books just makes me break out in a rash like the absolute mortification and, and the odd time i do have to read them for whatever it's unbearable. I just want to get the red pen and like take out entire chapters and like delete characters. And because I think that's the same with no matter what you do, like the idea is that we get better at it, like the more we do of it. Um, and for as long as I'm trying to do this, I will always be making mistakes. And the hope is, I suppose, that I will. I mean, and people are very nice in that they will kindly point out, you know, the disasters and, you know, and where I've gone wrong. You know, people very kind that way, Philip. Do you know, <laughs> like they don't they don't hold back at all. You know, and it'd be hard for them to keep their mouth shut. But no, they go out of their way to let me know all the ways I fucked it up. And I mean, and that is, of course, it's never exactly delicious at the time. But I would rather do my job properly. You know, so after kind of the sting dies down a bit, I think yeah, okay, right, they had a point, mm. or they didn't. But usually they did, and. And that's good, I think. Right, so with the next one, I uh, I won't I won't do that. But I'll do something else wrong. And that's I, you know at this stage I've realised two things. One, I'm very thin-skinned, and I don't like doing things wrong. And the second thing is that I'm always going to do things wrong. So I just have to accept accept both of those things because neither of them are going away. Hmm. No, it is that like, you know, we'd all like to go back and, you know, you go, okay, you know, you know the way bands do this a lot, the bastards, they can do this, right? They can do a remix or they can put out a better version or re-record it. We don't get to yeah, do that, right? Yeah, yeah. But again, I mean, you were, oh. you were talking about accountancy there and like I come from a different kind of writing, you know, what I write every day and what I get paid for is wrapping tomorrow's chips, right? And, you know, it's, it's just, it's news articles, it's that kind of thing that goes out there. So it's a different kind and I, you don't get to be precious about it. And to, They're fabulous. Yeah, but, you know, to, to be honest, I don't, I don't think I'm that great a lot of the time. I do enjoy writing fiction and that kind of thing, and I enjoy writing long-form stuff and that kind of thing. But like you say, people are, you know, they, they yeah. wouldn't be behind the door and having a pop at you for these things. But you were saying that you weren't sort of, you know, you never studied English literature. You never went to the course and that kind yeah. of thing, you know. But um, did you ever feel the need, even after all your success, do you ever think, geez, you know, I mean, maybe I could do this? Because, you know, I've looked at every writing course under the sun and every video course and camera course and that kind of thing. I haven't done any of them, but, you know, it was been in my mind that one of these days I might like to do yeah. this because on the other side of the thing you must be doing something right if all these people are buying your books right uh, thanks thanks Philip no it's funny I was actually due to be doing a course in November and I'm, I'm hoping it'll still go ahead there's um the, the University of Limerick do a, a winter school in Doolan in Clare um, and I'm hoping to do it because I I'd love to be able to construct sentences in a more elegant way. Um, you know when you read somebody and you know that their style is really different different to yours and, and you can't really identify how. 
I'd love to have time to study that and to write one of my crappy sentences and then to try and reconfigure it into their version. Um, so I've often thought about doing courses and hopefully this will go ahead. I mean, it's not until November. Um, and, I, you know, I, I rather than actually try and write something to be published, just to spend time fiddling around with the craft of something, mm. I think it would be very enjoyable. Because like I love words and I love language and I love the ability, like if anyone constructs words in a particular order, a particular set of words in a particular order, it can be so powerful, like it can make people laugh or it can really move people. And I would just, I'd like to be better at that. Mm. Uh, it is an amazing sort of a thing, you know, because it, it, they're, they're the same words. We all have access to the same words, but it yeah. just happens to be how people put them together. But one of the things, Maria, yeah. that I find when I, when I read your books and what you write and the way you express yourself is that it's very direct. You know, there's, there's no sort of, you know, yeah. you don't have to have like, you know, f four years in Trinity behind you to be able to understand no. what you're writing. And I think that that is a huge, huge value. Because again, if I go back to what I was saying about writing books for people who don't read, we write things for teenagers. Uh, the footballer Zlatan Ibrahimovic is a Swedish footballer, and he had a biography that every young fella in the tracksuit bottoms of this country read, but they never read anything else. And I often feel that they were sort of, you know, you know this thing of, oh, we're, we're writing literature here, you know, and that's sort of a closed the door for many yeah. of those people. Is that something that, and this is not to say, you know, you, I mean, you probably sold as many books as the Beatles have albums at this stage. Is that a conscious thing that you still try to be as sort of as accessible as possible to the people who read yeah. your books? Yeah, like when I started writing, there was no kind of long run up to it or anything. And I wrote as I speak, and I had no idea that this was a thing I was doing, but I was brought up with oral storytelling, like my mother is really funny and my sisters are really funny and so it just seemed natural that if I was going to write a book I was going to write it as I spoke so yeah my books are very conversational and they're immediate they're they're friendly um and they're confiding and it's it's almost like an oral tradition brought into a, a written tradition and this is what I like doing I mean I like that feeling of that the reader can consider me their friend you know, and that it's a very intimate bond and it's immediate, you know, and as a person, I have no boundaries. And and that's my writing style as well. You know, it's very kind of oversharing. It's telling you everything. And I didn't realize that people would kind of, uh, would be, would respond as well as they did, you know, and I, I'm, I'm just really grateful that like, that's, that's the way it's gone for me. And my first three books were for First person, so it was kind of very easy to continue that kind of chatty, confiding tone. It's different when I'm doing, you know, um, a third person book as I did with Grown Ups, you know, which was like seven different main characters. And so I still try and get inside their heads and have their own particular way of thinking and talking. Um, that again is very accessible, but unique. Mm. So it's more of an effort with, with lots of people in the book, but it's still something that this is what I want to do. You know, and I never want to be the writer that they say, this writer repays effort. Do you know that you have to kind of battle to get into whatever the writer is saying? And that's fine for lots of writers and, and lots of readers, but that's not me. It's not what I want from a book to read or to write. Mm. When you sit down, right, and when there's no coronavirus, and we, when we don't have to worry about imminent death, pestilence, and never make it money again, right? Yeah. When you get an idea for a book, is it something that grows like a little seed, or is it something that sort of, you know, pops up overnight, or does it, like, I get these lightning bolts, right, and I get, if yeah. I'm bloody lucky, I get four or five throughout the book, and they will be the sort of, you know, the foundations that I build it on, and, you know, I, yeah. I never worry that they're going to come, I know that they're going to come, but I just don't know when, but how does it work for you? Do you think, oh, that's a story I'd love to tell and, and if so where do you discover yeah. those stories oh I mean I, I think for me because I'm writing about emotional landscapes you know I'm just writing about human beings and and all the weird stuff we go through and I, I'm fully convinced that like each of us has a universe inside of us you know and we don't even know a tiny bit of it in our lifetime so I think the possibilities are infinite for me if, if that's your subject matter um, and with the grown-ups, the idea came to me suddenly because, and this is a terrible story, but and I will disguise the, the, the identity of the person very heavily, but 
I'm, I have a group of friends and we've been friends for a long time and we go away together and, you know, we have like, we're very close, mm. you know, and in the last few years, one of them um, got a new partner and this new partner has been tricky to put it mildly and just, I don't know, rows break out around her and, and bad stuff goes down and there's drunken, horrible arguments and people end up like shouting outside in the road late at night. <laughs> But none of it is to do with, you know, she starts it and then kind of sets the pins rolling and then kind of, uh, you know, steps out of it. She comes out of it like, you know, clean. Mm. And any weekend that I'm with her, I wake up on the Sunday morning just feeling like I want to die. Like, I mean, I don't drink anymore, but like I have that kind of awful emotional hangover of feeling like I hate everyone and everyone hates me and human beings are awful and I don't know why we ever bother. Mm. Well, recently enough, we went to and she couldn't come and we were all throwing our hats up in the air and we heard like we were absolutely thrilled and the next time oh yeah and then we went and we had such a harmonious time the next time I met her she made reference to the weekend she hadn't been there and just for a split second the words went through my head and I, you know the words were we had such a lovely time because you weren't there and it just dawned me what if I had said that or what if somebody in a family or group of friends suddenly can't stop telling the truth because with any kind of enmeshed relationships there are things you can't say or you don't say because you want to protect people you know you don't want to hurt them or you don't want to to bring up unpleasant situations that you're not going to be able to back out of and so that was the idea for, like, so that actually was a blinding flash sort of a moment. I thought, okay, grand. I write about a family. They're all very close. Some of them get on, but obviously it's complicated because nothing is ever black and white. It's all, you know, nuanced. So, yeah, and what if somebody started telling the truth about all those grey areas? So, but I was lucky with that one. Um, other ones, I have to kind of sit around for six months in the terror that, like, that's it. I'm all used up. And I'm going to have to go back and train to be a nail technician, which is actually something I've wanted to do for a long time. So I'm not I'm not without options, Philip. I am not without other other opportunities. Well, I'll tell you something for another. But the uh, you know when I was sort of looking at various different Wikipedia pages and, uh, and interviews with you beforehand and that kind of thing, what's it like to walk around the place knowing that you've sold all the books? That everybody has one of your books somewhere. It does. Does that not sort of you know? Does your head get this big going through an airport? It absolutely doesn't. It's so it, lots of reasons. Lots of reasons. I mean, I think it would be incredibly unhealthy to think that that way. Mm. Um, also, I I had come into recovery for alcoholism before I before any of this happened to me, and I learned. I, got, I got, went right down into my bones, the, the knowledge that, like, I can't hang my happiness on success in my career no. or a happy relationship or or any of those externals, do you know? And I'm really glad I, I knew that because it has made me very, very uh, cautious mm. about letting my ego take over. And that's not to say that I don't have moments, like, of delight, and I do, but, like, my life is very, I don't know the word, normal. Yeah. Do you know, I live in a suburb of Dublin. Like my favorite people are my, my brothers and sisters and my mother and my husband. Mm. Like, I, you know, and I, I think if you go around kind of acting like you're something special, people might treat you like that to your face, but it means that proper intimacy is very difficult. You know, so... And though proper intimacy is more important than people treat me like I'm somebody special. And like, I'm not. I'm not. I don't deserve any of this. And just because I can do something that, I don't know, what's the word? That has a wide spread. Yeah. It doesn't make me a better person. It doesn't make me more uh, worthy. or it, it means nothing in terms of my worth as a person mm. and that, that's not to say that I'm not very 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 grateful because I am you know and the thing that I always I found very difficult was I always felt very disconnected I felt like a right weirdo and oddball like someone who was very out of step with mm. other human beings and the great reward of my of my books being read in such big numbers is that I feel not such a shambles of a human being anymore like I feel that my broken bits aren't unique. Mm. That 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 I'm 
I don't know, I, I don't hide them as well as other people maybe. Yeah. But they were all, all the same and we all have those fears and those feelings of kind of being useless or alone or, 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 or different, I suppose. So that's a very long, long answer, Philip. But no, I don't, I don't wake up and think, hurroo, I'm a best-selling author. And, and I would hate to be the person who did. Do you think uh, if you hadn't gone through what you went through and if you hadn't gone into recovery and that kind of thing, do you think that if you'd had the same success and you were still drinking that you would be absolutely unbearable and that you would see these things differently? Or do you think that, you know, because there's, there's something very pure about your person nowadays when you don't drink and that kind of thing and you're, you're very, very humble. I personally think that, you know, you are a special person to me and the way that you write and you're obviously a special person to Manny. But like you say, it doesn't make you better than anybody else. It just makes you somebody who's very much appreciated. But do you think that, you know, if you yeah. if you were still having a few drinks and behaving the same way, that you would have been a pain in the backside? Oh, my God, I would have been a complete nightmare. <laughs> Success for the person I was. Oh, no, I'm serious. Oh, I, I would have been awful. And, and I would have been an egomaniac. And I would have been incredibly bitter about anyone else's successes because that's the kind of person I was before. You know, I felt like the world was a zero sum game. And so if somebody got something else, it meant there was less left over for me. Um, but I, Philip, I wouldn't have had any success because when I was drinking, I created nothing. Like, and towards the end of my drinking, like, I. I barely went to work. Like I had no discipline and I had no sense of responsibility. I just, it wouldn't have happened. It's, you know, maybe I might have been lucky to have written one book and then I would have cruised on that for as long as I could, you know, going to festivals and drinking my head off and, and swaggering around thinking I was something special. And then when it came time to write again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to, I know I wouldn't. Mm. I was um, listening to an audio book lately because that's, you know, it's, I hadn't really done it until I was in Portugal about two yeah. weeks ago and I started and I was listening to a book, uh, it's by the bass player from Joy Division in New Order, a guy called Peter Hook, right? And he, yeah. he, was, making this, oh, yeah. he, he was making this point that, you know, um, bands make a great first album, maybe a great second album and then it tends to tail off and he says it's because they learn music. I don't really agree with him. I think it's kind of a lot to do with the kind of thing that you're saying there. Once you get that little bit of success and the people treat you like a star and they love up the drinks in your dressing room before you go on Scotland or whatever else it yeah. is and that that's actually you know I usually say that when I was drinking I probably stopped about 10 years ago that the only thing I made before that was trouble and yet within a year of, of finishing yeah. I published a book with Gillian Macmillan about the Irish in Stockholm here you know so I mean do you see like if you think back did you try to create when you before you went into recovery was writing something you always tried to do and did alcohol sort of you know was that a barrier to it? No, I mean, I tell you, I tried actually to get into study journalism um, when I uh, left university. Um, they had just started, I think it was the first year they had done the uh, journalism course in DCU mm. here. And you see, I knew that I loved words and I, like I always read and I knew I could be funny. And I mean, as it happened, I would have been a terrible journalist, but it never even occurred to me to write novels, but I thought the journalism was a kind of a a way into a career that I could have tried because it involved writing and I didn't get in and that shut down everything for about nine years like I was just so mortified that I had even had the audacity to apply and it was only towards the very end of my drinking when I mean definitely my life was like this island that was just getting smaller and smaller and smaller and there was so so little left mm. to, to stand on that it was about four months before I, I eventually had to stop and went into rehab. Just this urge to write a short story just kind of, it came, you know, ostensibly from nowhere. But I do think it was that, that urge in all of us to kind of keep ourselves alive. Um, I do think it kind of, it, something inside me, that urge kind of, you know, pulled us out like, you know, something from the bottom of the sea and said, I give you this. You know, if I give you this, can you stay for this? Yeah. And over those four months, I wrote four, I think it was four or five short stories. I mean, they were all really odd because, and they were very much a kind of a reflection of my state of mind at the time, which was extremely nihilistic. But, but it had opened something in me, you know, and like that first short story I wrote was the first thing I had ever done that I was proud of. Mm. Like I'd gone to college, I'd got a law degree, and that felt like nothing to me because I thought, look, if I can get a law degree, obviously anyone can. 
But this, this was different. And so after I'd gone through rehab then, that was still waiting for me. So yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't a frustrated writer all my life at all. I was, I was a reader, um, which in a way is another, is another sort of apprenticeship for being a writer. Mm. Well, that's the thing. I mean, if you can't read, you can't write. And that's, you know, I usually tell kids yeah. about, about journalism, you know, that 90% of this is, uh, is reading, you know, because if you don't know anything, you can't tell people anything, you can't put things into context. Yeah. And just to get back to what you were saying there, you know, I think you were right to skip journalism because a, a very good friend and a mentor of mine once said, so people think that journalists are people who love writing. No, no, we hate writing. It's why we do it so quickly, you know? And it's just one of those things that sort of stuck with me. It's like, right, get it done, get it out there, that kind of thing. But moving on to that subject of reading and that kind of thing, I, I sort of said to you last night, I asked you if you could sort of grab a couple of books or a couple of recommendations, yeah. because let's a lot of people they're not commuting now so they have a lot of time in their hands they're sitting there i mean yeah. it's great that people are watching this show on youtube it's great that you know people are doing stuff but give us a couple of books there that you're reading or things that you've okay. enjoyed lately okay okay i'm going to hold one up to the screen oh, hold on now. my god there you go pull, can you see yeah, that pull it back just a little bit our little cruelties okay. liz nugent our little cruelties by liz nugent yeah it's her new one it's her fifth one it's it's her fifth or her fourth might be her fourth it's it's her best it's um I mean, she's described as crime, but she's not really. I mean, she's much, it's much more complicated. This is about three brothers and oh my God, they are horrific to each other. Like they are so, like her books are about human nature in its darkest, most unpleasant. I mean, she revels in it. She celebrates it and it is gripping. It's, it's, it's moving. It's at funny at times, very sad. Um, and the writing is really, really good. And, I mean, the timeline is beautifully done, you know, because you're getting the three different lives told from three different points of view, like over like 40 years. Um, so that actually came out yesterday. And I really, re it's her best. And that's saying something. Yeah. Now, this is something entirely different. Um, it's called Gravity is the Thing. Um, this is the sister of Nicola Moriarty, who wrote Big Little Lies yeah. and, and similar. Gravity is the thing now, it won't be for everyone, but if it if it is for you, you will adore it. It's whimsical. Mm -hmm. It's about a woman who is learning to fly. And I don't mean in a play, plane, I mean like with her arms oh, like no. out in the sky. And that's the only whimsical thing in it really, but it's a big one. Um, and other than that, it's about her relationship with her young son, it's about the breakup of her marriage. It's about love in all its forms. It's so touching. It's so beautiful. It could possibly be my most favorite book of all time. Oh, Lord. Like, I know, I know, I know. Like, and I mean, I'm when I love something, like I really love something, I don't do things by halves, mm. but I adore this book so much. It's beautiful. And it's funny, I was looking at some of the reviews on, um, Amazon, Amazon.com, people in the States, you know, and I find that there's a type of reader in the United States. So many of them read to learn something. They're all about the worthy read. Mm -hmm. And they were baffled by this beautiful book, <laughs> baffled. I mean, they just couldn't get that. It's about, it's about kind of magical thinking and it's about pleasure and beauty and, and, and just, yeah, kind of the possibility of kind of transcendence in everyday life. Um, so, as I say, it's not for everyone. If you like to read your book and learn about, you know, wrestle with ethical issues, you probably won't love this, but I loved it. Now, I don't have copies of the other books I'm going to tell you about. Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell is coming probably in about a week. It is so beautiful. It's about William Shakespeare's son. Oh, wow. Who, yeah, actually, I just realized he dies of... Um, the, the plague. Um, yeah, sorry, lads. Sorry if I'm being S intense. Spoiler alert. <laughs> he was miles worse. Miles worse. No one's dying. It's all right. We're all it's grand. Grand. <laughs> Yeah, we're all fine. We're all fine. No, they didn't have debt or anything like that back then. No, no, no. That won't happen to us. But again, it's beautiful. It's about about his grief, about what he does with it. It's about his wife. It's about how their marriage suffers because of this. This awful, huge thing that they can't discuss. It is so beautifully written. It is so moving. Um, I was really surprised that it wasn't um, 
maybe it's not no no it probably wasn't submitted for the um the women's prize for fiction because i just feel this is the kind of book that will win billions of prizes um now hold on i've checked my list i'll give you one more Roger. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh okay um this isn't a new release but it's called it's the Cazalet Chronicles, and it's written by Elizabeth Jane Howard, who had the misfortune to be married to King Le Kingsley Amos for a while, um, but 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 then they divorced, and she 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 was grand then. And these are four different books, and they are set in a big English family before the Second World War, and then into the fifties and and beyond. And it's the characterization; it's like a really elegant soap opera. Um, and there are four in the series. I mean, that's. The nice thing, like you read one and you'll adore it, and then you'll know that there's three more, and then you'll be even more happy. Um, anyone I've ever recommended them to has loved them. And are they all sort of related to one another? Do they all does one follow the other? Yeah, kind of yeah, thing? yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're just one long continuation of a, of a family. Because mm. that's one of those things that I always felt as a young person reading books that you know there's a sense of bereavement when you get to the end of a really good book and you go, yeah, but, but I don't want this to end, kind of thing, you know. Yes. Uh, yeah, but how am I going to know what happened to them? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's an awful feeling. Well, that's the thing. Well, we actually had this thing with uh, the two books. The club that we started is called Sphere United, right? There's no football club called that. So it was one of these things. We set it up and we had this, uh, you know, there's this, uh, the, the main character in the first book. They said to, him, to us, okay, he's brilliant. Can we have him back in the second book? And we were kind of going, we want to kill him now. We want to create somebody else. And they got, oh, you can't kill him. Oh, He's brilliant. You can't. I, I, well, you know, we sort of thought, well, we could give it a go. Like, we might get rid of him. And in the end, we brought him back. But we, we brought him back and we made him into something He's not, right? Because you know the way when you go through something, you should come out the other side of that and maybe you should be the person who's willing to help the next person. But he's not 100% willing yeah. to do that. So we gave him a little bit of a darker side and I think he benefits from that though, you know? But have you ever had any yeah. any ambition to get into, you know, stage writing, screenwriting, stand-up comedy? You'd be a brilliant stand-up comic, any of that, no? You're so lovely, Philip. I'll tell you, you know the way in the modern world we're always meant to be improving and striving and to have like five-year goals and stuff like that and, and to diversify and, you know, to have a kind of a, a multifaceted brand. Mm -hmm. I spent my entire life wanting to be different, you know, wanting to be better, wanting to change myself and improve myself. And I, all I want to do is write my novels. Mm -hmm. Like, I love that there is almost nobody between me and my reader. Like, it's a very intimate relationship. Um, and I'm not a good, what's that word, collaborator. Yeah. Like, I'm not, you know. And this is all I really want to do. To be quite honest, I did a stand-up thing um, on the Queen Mary ship. It's a long story. I was the writer-in-residence um, for a week last, last winter. And um, I did one session where I stood on the stage for an hour and told my funny stories. And actually, I have to say, I did really enjoy that. But other than that, I wouldn't mind doing that again. But other than that, I have no desire to do anything else except keep writing books. Because it's just the loveliest feeling not to want to be different. Yeah. It's just the loveliest feeling to think, Jesus, I love my job. Yeah. You know, it's, it's so unusual for me to, to kind of be comfortable in myself. So no no plans, Philip, at all. Yeah. Apart from maybe I wouldn't mind doing the stand-up. Yeah, no, I'd actually love to see you doing it because when you know, we were talking about Scowl on there, this is the, the talk show that's on Swedish oh, yeah. and Norwegian TV. And it, like when you're on that, it's brilliant because you're so engaging. And like you say, you don't, I mean, Jesus, compared to the Scandinavians, you have no boundaries whatsoever. But when you talk <laughs> like in that sort of honest manner that you do, and I'm there going, yep, yeah, this is it. This is this is how people communicate because you know we were talking about social yeah. distancing in the last while, otherwise known as living in Scandinavia. You know, so I'd love to see you doing more more stand up or that kind of thing. You know, but um, when you go on shows like that, because I think part of you secretly does enjoy getting out there, not for too long, but just for a couple of weeks and doing yeah. your publicity tours and the travelling. Are you going to miss that travelling now for the next couple of months? Do you think? Kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that feeling of kind of. I mean, I love living in Ireland. Like, I love this place. Um, but yeah, I am feeling a bit, you know, itchy. Um, yeah, there is something very delicious about being on a book tour because you don't have to do any other work. Like, all kind of normal stuff is removed. Like, I just seem to spend the entire of February, like, sitting on a train, eating Percy pigs and chocolate. Like, you know, I can eat whatever I like and I can, you know, 
all normal stuff is is removed and yeah now that I'm having to cook the dinner every evening and and you know be responsible and be present it isn't as much crack crack as a as the being you broke up just a little bit there but we got the sort of the general gist of that anyway I I was in Portugal there Uh, I came back last week and uh, then just after that the Euros was cancelled and you're kind of thinking you know now I have sort of three weeks and the the Olympics might be cancelled as well you know what that's fine we'll find something to do but I was thinking ah Jesus you know three weeks to do my own laundry and making the dinners at home and that kind of thing you know but uh, has it changed has it changed your plans what what are you going to do now from you know this is the middle of March kind of time what what are you going to do with the rest of the year so to speak are you hoping to get back to writing soon enough yeah I mean as I said at the start like um, my concentration is banjoed but that is that was always the plan that I you know the minute I came back from from the book tour that I'd start writing again I tell you Philip I really miss the football you know I love the structure that the football season gives to the year and I I find I I'm quite anxious without it you know I like the rhythm of the week um and I mean I don't really know because like the only person I'm seeing is my husband and my mother. You see, my mother is a vulnerable person yep. and, you know, and to keep her safe, I'm the only one. So it means that I can't see my nieces, my nephews, my brothers and my sisters. And I, I'm i okay right now. Um, and I just wonder how okay we'll all be with having to be away from the people we love. And, you know... To do without them is a worry. Um, and so I suppose I'm trying to have a routine at the moment, you know, and do kind of interesting things like make interesting dinners, yeah. make sure I exercise every, every day. Now, I'm a failed meditator, but people might find it helpful. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of important to mind, well, for me to kind of manage my state of mind, mm-hmm. like because I'm prone to kind of tipping into the pit mm. and I really don't want to go there so at the same time though I'm trying to keep things in the day yeah. and just go well I'm all right today mm. um, but I think it would be foolish to under- underestimate how challenging it might become mm. and even things like I've stopped texting people I, I'm, just, I'm picking up the phone and I'm ringing them mm. you know just to hear a voice just to have a conversation because we need human contact but well, I certainly do yeah. um, it's funny I mean I am an introvert but I certainly I need people I need people who love me and that I love and I need to be made to laugh mm. um, so it's a the plan is that I will work but I'm certainly not at my optimum at the moment mm. I don't think any of us can be because we're scared yeah. um, well no, I'm not scared all the time but it's their kind of you know chewing away yeah. at, you know, in the at kind of my sense of well-being. Yeah, yeah very much, I, yeah. I, I'll tell you what I'm going to do now. I'm going to share my biggest worry at the moment, right, is that um, next week there's a hotel opening in Sweden and I've been asked to go along and film it because you can't have a whole lot of journalists there, right? And so, you know, yeah. I'll go down, I'll film it and it'll be distributed to everybody, right? The problem is that the hotel is being opened by your man Bjorn from ABBA, right? Bjorn Ulvaeus. Now, myself and Bjorn get along very well. Yes, yes, yes. Because I treat him like, you know, a normal person. And, you know, that's, millionaires don't often get that you know but uh, I was thinking Jesus if I go down there imagine if I have the coronavirus and I end up killing the poor man I'll never live this down you know so but you know it's, no, you wouldn't <laughs> there's no way you get away with that you know but I think the, the big thing really is that um we have to find new ways of dealing with each other, you know, and, you know, in WhatsApp groups and yeah. that kind of thing. And they could be good and bad. That was one of the questions actually I want to ask you. What kind of WhatsApper are you? Do you send like all that? Well, you know, I heard from this person, this kind of thing. Or are you a little bit more going, ah, take it easy now, kids. There's, you know, not too much to worry about. Oh, my God. I mean, I'm I'm very much the opposite of doom mongering, you know, like every now and again you know, people on the WhatsApp groups, oh, my buddy's in the army. He says, we're going into lockdown on Friday night for sure. It's going to be tanks on the streets and nobody can go anywhere. And, I, you know, I really don't think that's helpful. Um, and like the first time I saw it, I was like, <gasps> quick, yeah. go out and buy everything in the supermarkets, you know. And now, now I don't feel like that at all. You know, um, I think, I mean, who knows? I haven't a clue what's going to happen. But until it's happened, I don't think there's any point worrying about, you know, I, I, you know, I'm not a bit like that and I don't 
it kind of irritates me that kind of unsun what is it unsubstantiated rumor um yeah, yeah i mean but like you know it's feckin' frightening enough we don't need any of that nonsense mm. on, in on top of us um and i you know and i'm also trying really hard not to stockpile and i mean it's hard Hard because you go, I'm not stockpiling, I'm fine, you know, I'm going to behave like a, you know, a reasonable person, there's plenty for all of us. And then you go down and the, the shelves are empty. Yeah. And it's hard then not to respond with, you know, Christ, you know, let's have the, the, the keen with the sack of keen with that we would never eat anyway. Buy it fast, you know, and, and cans of prunes, quickly, quickly, you know. Yeah. Um, that isn't helpful either. Yeah. Um, stockpiling is, is, is a really mean thing to do. Um, you know, I'm very aware of you know, people like my mother, you know, who, they, they, they can't, hmm. like, you know, she can't stockpile, like, you know, she couldn't carry the stuff, Yeah. you know, and for lots of people, they don't have the money to do it, yeah. like, all they, all they can do is buy, like, one, one shop to keep them going for, like, four days or the week or whatever, yeah. I mean, I think it's really important that we keep in mind the most vulnerable in our society, hmm. there is, there is something really shameful about having, you know, presses, like, bursting at the seams with pasta when there's like people down there not able to get bread yeah do you know mm. it's we have to think collectively rather than than just about ourselves yeah i was thinking about one of those things there because the schools in sweden haven't closed yet they're going to close very very soon right oh. but you know it's, it's going yeah. to happen probably my, and my wife is a school teacher and of course i'd be one of these people saying the schools should be closed but i'm also very aware of where i live marion and i live with people who aren't as well off as me and that's just being honest about it i tend to earn a little bit more than they yeah. do right and in a lot of cases the kids who go to the schools in my area that might be the only meal they get you know that might be the only decent meal like oh is their gosh. school lunch every day right. so yeah we have to be very conscious of how privileged we are to be able to, to even have yeah. the opportunity to go down and fill a supermarket trolley is not something that everybody has to have a person at home like yourself exactly. or myself who who is capable enough and competent enough to make that into a meal and that and we you know and we have to also look out for those people as well you know to see who are the kids who are the, the people who are falling through the net who are the people who yeah. aren't being looked after in that situation you know how is your mom is she soldiering away there is she she is she is she is um yesterday my brother went over with um his two and a half year old little girl yeah. and they sat on the grass outside the house yeah. and so mom got a look Look at Hannah. Like she craves her grandchildren. Like um, you know, the new baby Tomas is two months and, and Hannah is two and a half and Teddy is five. And like she really they're her world really. Um although the other thing she loves is books, so at least I can keep her supplied with them. Yeah. And uh and um and chocolate, you know, kind of anything nice. But even things like I know this might sound trite and you know, but things like hand cream, you know, if people are washing their hands an awful lot, like for me to put hand cream on my mother's hands is something I can do for her. You know, when we're being deprived of affection, where you know, she's been so deprived of human touch, mm. um, things like that. But she's oh, do you know what made her really happy? And I know you will laugh and I laugh too, but then I was sort of glad of it. RTE are running mass every morning at half ten. Yep. And that has like that changed her world. Like I rang her this morning at about twenty to, le to eleven and she nearly took the head off me <laughs> because I'd rung her in the middle of mass. And that really helps. I mean she was so upset that she couldn't go to mass on a Sunday. Um so I think that's given them her anyway a huge kind of lift. Mm. And um yeah, you know, I just want her to be a Okay. Well, it's going back to that thing that you mentioned earlier on. Actually, you mentioned a couple of times in this conversation now about structure, about routine, and that kind of thing. You know, because somebody yeah. was being a little bit snide on Twitter, going, "Oh, you know, now I have to sit in one place where usually I can go to three same places every day," and that kind of thing. You know, and that is essentially, you know, we are creatures of habit and that kind of thing. And if you're used to being able to touch your mother, and she's used to being able to hug her grandchildren, yeah. well, then that's a big thing that's taken out of her day. You know what I mean? But like, I was at the, I do a lot of martial arts, that kind of thing. I was at the club today because the chiropractor's in the same place as the martial arts club it's the best business idea i've ever seen right because that fella's bench is always full you know but that was the first time you know because usually we'd be engaged in contact and wrestling and, and that kind of thing you know and that hasn't happened for two or three weeks and you do miss it because you miss your friends at the club and that kind of thing as well you know so we we need to be very very careful and to, to do exactly what you're doing rather than uh texting people or whatever pick up the phone 
talk to them for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Yeah. Make sure yeah. they're all uh, alive and that they're keeping well and that kind of thing. Listen, I've kept you long enough now. Yeah. There are books to write. There are dinners to make by the sound of things using non-hoarded supplies <laughs> there in, uh, in County Dublin. Marianne, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. And I hope that you and yours are hail and hearty and that you continue to be so. And that when we come out the other side of this, there'll be another book and another chance to have another conversation like this one. Thanks so much for talking to me.